what has the French Revolution, the philosophy of enlightenment and Frankenstein to do with women's right to vote? Huh? If you are ready to follow the traces to the very, very beginning of women's suffrage, now is your time. So unless your time traveling suits as we will be visiting 18th century homes. Bolette de Gouge was not only an anti-slavery activist that distributed leaflets, pamphlets and wrote theatre plays on the same topic, but she was also advocating for women's rights. As a self-taught writer, Olympe was an example for the intellectual capabilities of the female sex. Even its structural disadvantages tried to restrict women at that time from gaining intellectual, public and political power. In order to discover how her fight for an equalitarian society made her the target for many intrigues that eventually led to the imprisonment of her in the Bastille, we need to take a look at the French Revolution, an event that first sparked hope for political advancement in the representation of women. We'll see how far that goes. Olympe de Gouche was first excited about the outbreak of the French Revolution, but quickly came to realize that égalité, so equal rights, did not include women. Disappointed by the fact that one male ruling class was just simply substituting the other, she published the Déclaration des droits de la femme et de la citoyenne in 1791, in which she called the new constitutional monarchy illegitimate, and for a good reason. Even though women took an active part in the revolution and helped overthrowing the old regime, not one woman was present when the new constitution was drafted, and neither did women have the chance to speak up for their rights and concerns publicly. Gouche stated, a woman has the right to mount the scaffold. She must possess equally the right to mount the speaker's platform. Reasonable, right? Well, to sum up, for Robespierre and the new male ruling class, women were good enough to be part of the revolutionary force and bear the possibly deadly consequences of that, but the inclusion of women ended right there. Robespierre's regime just ignored half of the population after they gained power. Olympe was well ahead of her time in her fight for an equalitarian society. So you can imagine that the odds were against her. Because of her political opinion, anti-slavery and pro-equality, Olympe was arrested in 793 without the right to have an attorney. She thus tried to defend herself in court. However, her theater plays were used as evidence against her, specifically one in which she engages in a fictional dialogue with Marie Antoinette, the old queen. There, Olympe de Gouche makes critical statements against Robespierre's cruel violence and the killing of members of the formerly ruling class. While Olympe clearly wanted change, but not on the base of violence, she was accused of being an enemy to the revolution. Only a few months later, Olympe will get executed on the Place de la Concorde in Paris. Not only to silence her critical voice, but also as a clear warning for other politically active women. Murdering Olympe de Gouges didn't prevent her works and hence her thoughts from spreading. Her Déclaration had been widely reproduced through supporters and influenced the thinking and writing of many, many women's advocates in the Western world. Just a few months before Olympe's death and one year after the publication of her Déclaration, Mary Wollstonecraft, a keen observer of the French Revolution, published the Vindication of the Rights of Women. Wollstonecraft's thinking was heavily influenced by Rousseau and the philosophy of enlightenment. A society designed by Wollstonecraft would hence be founded on reason solely, in which men and women would be equally valued as rational beings. Let's think real quick what this would actually mean, very practically. If both genders are considered rational, if both can make decisions based on reason solely and anticipate logical consequences of their actions, there is no valid argument anymore that could legitimize withholding the vote for women and limiting their participation in the public and political sphere. Sounds like it could shatter the existing order? Absolutely. And as you can imagine, for the male ruling class, giving up their power wasn't exactly their cup of tea. In a time in which race was seen as an exclusive characteristic for men and women were hence drafted as the opposite, so irrational and mentally challenged, Wollstonecraft's writings encountered a lot of resistance. Not only did she argue that women were against common belief, just as intellectually capable as men, but also that their seeming lack of ratio was a consequence of a lack of access to proper education. 
access that was withheld by the male ruling class. She thus not only attacked the legitimization of men as rulers based on a presumed intellectual superiority, but also as them actively hindering women's rational and intellectual capabilities to develop. Just as Olympe de Gouche, Mary Wollstonecraft has been villainized, and what both women pleaded for has been used against them, even though in very different ways. While the very revolutionary Olympe suddenly became the embodiment of an enemy of the revolution, Mary Wollstonecraft's personal lifestyle was used as evidence that women weren't rational after all, to ridicule her work and her persona and thus to silence her influential voice. And in this case, the defamation campaign has actually been quite successful. Mary's lifestyle and family constellation has been, let's say, quite unconventional. She was an explorer in many ways, intellectually, in her critical thinking and her political activism, but also romantically. Mary moved outside of the monogamous heteronormative frame and hence violated the prescript to which a good woman was subjugated to. Mary Wollstonecraft was already considered a manifestation of an indecent woman. And after she dared to write about female sexual desires, that those exist, that they have them, that they want them to be fulfilled, finally her enemies had printed evidence against her in their hands. The woman that spoke up against discrediting female intellectual capabilities was now depicted as someone who had only pleasure and romantic feelings in mind. It was the death blow for Mary's career. She has been discredited and disgraced for good. Before she died in childbirth, bringing the wonderful Mary Shelley, later author of Frankenstein, to this world, she famously stated, I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. And based on this quote, we'll continue to trace the fight for our right to vote in the next episode. Stay tuned and see you next time. Bye!